However, I want to talk to you about the possibility of using what we've got. Because you cannot use any, chemicals really are not very effective against the larvae. So the chemicals we've got now, we can't use things like alder and yielder any longer, obviously. And so once the larvae are in the soil, they're pretty much immune to any chemicals that we can put in the soil that aren't going to get into the groundwater and that sort of thing. Nematodes are the only way to manage these weevils once they get in the soil. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is the possibility of conservation bio control with, with the nematodes that are already there, and the possibility of maybe doing some things a little differently in the way we apply these nematodes that might help uh, H. bacteriophora, or the nematode we've got available right now, do an even better job. Next slide. Okay, so, you know, until HLB came along, conservation biocontrol was the way we managed pests in Florida, and Florida was a leader in that for 100 years. You know, we learned how to do conservation biocontrol in a large degree from what happened in citrus orchards in California and Florida and places like that. So until a few years ago, you know, you were spraying very infrequently for pests. And for a lot of good reasons, uh, you know, that I've listed here, you all know very well um, uh, why, why that was the situation. Next slide, please. But despite the fact that, you know, conservation biocontrol was what you did, what the way that you managed your orchards, there's never really been any interest or, or um, study of the possibility of conservation biocontrol for organisms in the soil. And the reason for that primarily is we know very, very little. I mean, first of all, the soil is much more complex than what happens above ground. But also, we know very little about the organisms that are in the soil, how they interact in their ecology. And that, that's primarily what we study in my lab. Next slide. So I, I mentioned this, and let me just impress upon you that there's no place like Florida for uh, the presence of a, a really varied community and a large numbers of entomopathogenic nematodes. It's like Florida, the fact that we're practically, you know, everywhere in Florida is a very sandy soil, and a lot of places you might as well be on the beach. Um, it's just a haven for entomopathogenic nematodes. Um, this shows you a survey of groves that we did, 53 groves across uh, Florida. It shows you what species, the, primarily the dominant species, not all of them that we find. The point I want to make here is every single grove that we went into was positive with a lot of different species. And you'll never find this in any survey anywhere else in the world, even close. Um, the other thing to notice is that like this is these blue uh, portions of these things are represent heterorhabditis indica. It's everywhere. Other nematodes, like Steinonema diacrepiside, tend to be more focused in certain areas. And some of these EPNs are much more important than others. And we want to know why some of them are in some places and others are, are, uh, are not there. For example, here's SD. You find it a lot in the central ridge, but rather infrequently in the flatlands. And why is that? H. indica, you find it everywhere. And some of these other species, the same thing. This is one that we haven't named yet. It's a new species. You only find it in the flatlands. You find it a lot around the Arcadia area, and it seems to be a really effective nematode. Um, that root system that I showed you in the, in the very beginning, those, the, the growth that we got that out of looked like it was going to be absolutely annihilated by diacrepis, and it's doing really well right now. And the thing that impressed us when we were studying that growth is just how many of these nematodes and, and how well distributed these nematodes were. Next slide, please. So how did we learn about all these species? I'm serious, nobody in the world has ever seen anything quite like what we've got here in Florida. Well, the reason that we became aware is that we, when we would test these commercial products, this is a, a technique that Clay McCoy developed. This is just an inline filter, but the, the, um, the mesh size of that thing is perfect for nematodes to get in, but not ants. And the ants are a real thing when you're trying to do So we put a diacrepes lard in here and some sand and cap it off with some snap caps and bury this thing. And then go ahead and put our treatments out of these nematodes, with these nematodes, and a week later bring the cages back in and see how many were dead and what killed them. And what we found is we're really getting good efficacy, but in a lot of places, we really couldn't tell how well our product was working because it was all nematodes we didn't put in the soil. These, these were ones we had no idea were there. Next slide, please. In other areas, however, we wouldn't find very many of those natives, but, we, but our product was working very well. So that's where we started testing our products. But we got really curious about these places where nematodes could be killed as high, at rates as high as 80% in one week. And remember, they're in the soil for three or four months by native nematodes. That, that was just you know, an eye-opener that we really would like to understand.
understand more. Um, so what we and, and I've already told you over and over again that if we can figure out why we some of the good manifolds are in the places they're at, maybe there are things we can do to encourage that. Next slide, please. So it's a real simple model. Uh, you know, you've got the diacritics feeding on your citrus, and we think that in some places this diacritic population are controlled primarily by native nematodes. So we want to know, what is it about the soils that it control these nematodes? Is it indirectly through the natural enemies of these nematodes? Is it directly? What's the situation, and is there any way for us to exploit that? Another thing that's really important to understand about these, these nematodes is that they don't just continue to work after you put them in the soil, even though they come out in tens of thousands. When you put them in the soil, they'll kill maybe 80% of the larvae that are in the soil at that time. And they'll reduce the adult populations that emerge from the soil over a long period of time, like a year, by as much as like 50 or 60%. But when you put them in the soil, they kill all those larvae, and about a week later, if we bury more larvae, it's just like we can never put them there. So what happens? Next slide, please. Essentially what happens is when you put all of these nematodes into the soil, you're putting in food for their natural enemies. And the natural enemies can grow very quickly, and you've got things like Endo, you know, endoparasitic fungi and these cool trapping fungi that have these rings that can strip around them. And you have all these different kinds of fungi, mites, um, you have competitors uh, in the soil of free living nematodes that can compete with these EPNs and take over the cadaver. We found lots of things that happen when you put these nematodes in the soil that bring that population level right back down to the equilibrium that you had before you started. So it's, a, it's just like any other pesticide that's available today. It's a real short-term uh, short efficacy that you've got, non-persistent efficacy. I won't show you much data here today, um, uh, but the way that we're studying this primarily in our surveys and in our experiments and that sort of thing is we've developed qPCR primers now, so we can just take a soil sample, extract all the nematodes out of there, and we can go ahead and probe it to determine how many of all these different species of entomopathogenic nematodes that we have here in Florida. Uh, some of their natural enemies, these are some bacteria we discovered a, a number of years ago that I'll tell you a little bit more about. Some of these uh, fungi that kill nematodes, their competitors. Um, we can get all of that information just from a single soil sample now. So that's how we're doing the work. And when I show you some of this data, um, and you want to know where do those numbers come from, it's, it's from something like this. We just put it in a qPCR machine and, and it gives us numbers. It's, it's neat. So let me tell you about the possibility of conservation. Just a couple of examples that we've got. This is a study that we did. We started a number of years ago in a site that has very high populations of diacrepes. And it's not a particularly sandy soil. It's, uh, it's over near the city. Um, and um, what we did was just simply to excavate very large planting holes and fill them with rich sand. We brought in rich sand and dump trucks and, and, and filled the planting holes with rich sand, planted seedlings in um, 50 sites like that, and paired up with those sites with that where we planted in the sand. Uh, the plant, there were other trees planted into the native soil. And we let the trees grow for a while. And after a few years, we started monitoring what's happening in those two different soil types. Next slide, please. And essentially what we've seen in a lot of experiments, this just summarizes it, is with the qPCR, and we, you know, when we're saying how many nematodes are there, what species are there, whether it's in this um, sandy soil or in this native soil, um, these are different species of nematodes. I know this is a little bit blurry. But these are just different species of nematodes. We find about the same number of nematodes, a lot of times even more in the, uh, in the uh, native soil than we found in the sandy soil. But they're killing the weevils if we bury them in these cages at a much higher rate in the sandy soil. All right? And so the trees, and this is not, I mean, I didn't just pick these up. This is one growing in sand, and this is a tree growing in the, um, in the native soil. So there's a real big difference in the tree growth. There's also, you can see these cages that we put on the soil to catch diacrepes as they're coming up out of the soil. I think in the next slide, I probably have data on that, yeah. So, um, you know, in the, in the sandy soil, uh, over a period of a couple of years, this is the cumulative number of diacrepes we caught compared to in the, in the other soil. So about a 50% reduction in these soils with sand. Next slide. And this is just showing you the tree growth. Um, and the important thing was is that the survival um, was much higher in the sand. We lost very few trees for the first seven or eight years 
uh, whereas it was, I think at least, um, it was about 30% of the trees by the sixth year were gone, were dead uh, in this native soil. Um, they were much larger and they produced a lot more fruit. <coughs> so, I mentioned this just because we're interested kind of in looking at the ecology. We look to see what happens with the natural enemies and I won't tell you that story uh, here. But just to make the point that on the East Coast, and I don't know, maybe around here too, in places where the growers don't have good drainage, a lot of growers are using coarse sand and oversized planting holes in order to improve the drainage. So it is something that's not completely impractical even in something, uh, you know, like a big citrus growth. So that's one possibility of conserving uh, biological control. The second one on, on the next slide uh, is one that we wanted to look at because Arnold Schumann and Pete Spike and people like that are doing these, these uh, studies with uh, advanced citrus production systems or advanced production systems from APS here, where they are fertigating the young trees every single day to get them to grow more quickly, uh, planting at a higher density. And the idea is to stay ahead of greening losses to get production in maybe the second year instead of the fourth or fifth year. Uh, to get your profitability up there by the time you start losing a lot of trees. And it's going to be something probably that's extremely critical if we're going to keep ahead of breeding until, until better methods um, come along. But, you know, you've got to recognize that if you're fertigating every single day, as opposed to, you know, putting out dry fertilizer a few times and, and using microjets, the soil is completely changed. It's wetter, got lots more chemistry going on, you know, because they're fertigating every day. So it's very different, and we wanted to see, well, what is that doing to the various uh, species of nematodes and to the diacrepines that were in this growth? Next slide. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things I'm going to tell you about here that we noticed um, involves this little bacteria. And this is a cuticle of an infected juvenile of an entomopathogenic nematode uh, with a scanning electron microscope. And these are spores, these egg-shaped things, of a penny bacillus species that is, we are sure, used to be entomopathogenic, entomopathogenic, but they're not any longer. They probably met up with EPNs, you know, a million years ago and learned that all they have to do is hitch a ride with these guys and they can reproduce them in the insects. And so these are species-specific bacteria that simply stick to a nematode. They don't cause the nematode any harm whatsoever inside of the cadaver. But they slow it down. If it's got a lot of these spores, it doesn't move very effectively through the soil. So it doesn't find insects as effectively. And we wanted to know, well, does that really have any, uh, is that critical information though about naturally? Is, this, is it having any effect naturally? Because we can show in the, in the laboratory that, yeah, it has a big effect on its ability to kill this thing. Uh, when we got the true PCR probe, we were able to start looking at that possibility. Next slide, please. So in our old plot, here where we've got the um, advanced production system versus what we call the, uh, here we call it grower's choice, we need like a conventional city culture. First thing we found is the best nematode, the one you want in your grow more than any other one, S. diacrepizi, was significantly reduced where the ATS was being practiced. And you can see that we had many more, many bacillus species per nematode in those plots compared to the conventional citric culture. Um, which may be one of the reasons that the population is lower. Now, I told you, you know, you, that there's, there, there's so many differences in the soil, you can hardly, um, you hardly know where to start, but there are differences in pH and all kinds of chemistries and stuff. So the first thing we decided to look at was, what's the effect of pH on these bacteria? Could that be, uh, well, let me just show you two. No, go ahead, next slide, I'm sorry. Is that, um, it, you know, we had fewer diacrepes in the APS plot, and we had a lot more Diacrepes uh, abbreviatus, citrus root weevils in those plants than in the conventionally grown citrus. And we had, I think, 25 fold more phytophthora in those plots than we had in the conventionally grown citrus. So there may be some secondary um, effects of, of this treatment, some non target effects that we need to understand to try and overcome it if it really is a problem. Next slide, please. So when we looked at the effects of pH on these spores that attach to this, this nematode, we found that at a high pH, uh, the spores adhere very nicely, but at a low pH, they fall off. And what happened in the grove that Arnold was in was it was a grove at low pH, and his chemical treatments raised the pH up over 7. And the original pH was at about 5.5. 
So that very well could have been the reason why all of a sudden we have more penny bacillus sticking to these nematodes and fewer nematodes in those plots. There were also effects of things like phosphorus and stuff, but when we checked pH at different molarities of phosphorus, we didn't see any effect of phosphorus. So it looks like it's a pH effect on this, this uh, interaction between the nematodes and the uh, bacteria. You can see some of this in <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's what we saw in Arnold's plot. So we said, okay, let's go into another grove, and instead of raising the pH with chemistry, let's go into a grove that's got a high pH, and let's lower it and see if we get the same effect. So we used sulfur, uh, Tiger 90 sulfur, in some plots in a grove in Marto that has a naturally high pH over 7, and reduced the pH. And by the time the pH finally came down, it took about a year to get it down. It's what we're seeing is that at the low pH, we're seeing very few penny bacillus and more cyanide diaprepizone. So it looks like pH is having a, a fairly predictable effect on this nematode and natural enemies of this nematode. Okay, the next slide, please. But that's not the only reason. There's, there's, there's multiple reasons, and I, I don't understand all of them, why in, in Arnold's treatments and his APS, the, 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 the nematode, the S. diaphragmizite, does not survive as well. Even this is, this is the survival of that nematode in uh, Arnold's soil in the laboratory, in laboratory trials, compared to the conventional citriculture, you can see that it just doesn't survive as well. And when we get these different kinds of trapping nematodes or endoparasitic nematodes, they interact with those soils as well, and, and some of them are much worse in, under Arnold's conditions than they are in normal conditions. So there are other mechanisms involved in just this kind of bacillus thing that I'm showing you. Next slide, please. And one of them that we're focused on right now is the effect of soil moisture. Now, this is something that, again, that we can do something about in our soil. We, when we did those surveys I showed you, we measured everything we could think of in the soil, as well as all the natural enemies we could think of. And when we did all of the statistics and everything to try and understand what might be causing the spatial patterns of these nematodes across the state, the only thing that really stood out to us were things that affect soil moisture. Things like the depth of the groundwater and the water moving capacity of the soil, the organic matter, uh, the clay content. And what we're seeing in our, in our lab studies now as we, as we look at these different soils, APS versus conventional citriculture, at different moistures is that as the soil moisture increases, the survival of this styrene diacrepticide, and then the sort of blue one, decreases. That of heteroraphiditis indica is really not effective percept uh, perceptively, which really could be the reason that we got H indica all over the state and S. diacrepizide only on the central region and a few certain soils in the flatlands region. So again, some more, some more things that maybe we can fiddle around with and, um, and create a better environment for the nematodes that we have here in Florida. Next slide. So let me conclude that just by saying that that's kind of where we're at right now, trying to do more of this in the field to see if we're having an effect on the weevil. Um, what we know so far is low soil pH and drainage seem to favor control of diaprepizide by some of these nematodes that have the best shot at getting control of diaprepizide. You have to take my word for it that S. diaprepizide is the one you want. I'm not going to show you all that data. But that needs to Next slide, please. So what about the currently available nematodes that we can apply in the growth to get a quick knockdown on these guys? Next slide. This is what was used until recently, BioVector, which had Steiner Nemorito Brave, and Grubstake, which had heterorhabditis indica. Both of them really good products. And uh, Grubstake is no longer in business. That company is out of business that manufactured this, and I'm not aware of any products that have H indica at the moment. S. Rio Brave is not in production at the moment. So what we had, what was used last spring, were products like Nemesis G and Terranem. They're made by companies called Copert and um, Biovector Underwood, who used to produce Biovector. Um, and they have this H bacteria offer in them. Next slide, please. So that's what's available to us. Um, I think I've already told you in general, when we use H. Rio Brave, we're talking 70 to 85% control of the larvae that are in the soil, a reduction in the adults over time. Um, but with these other guys, not as good an efficacy. Um, nevertheless, they do kill diaprepines, and certain things make, an, make a difference in how well they kill these H. bacteria for how well they kill. Um, they're not as good as, just innately, they're not as good, like in laboratory trials, at killing S. diaprepines. But the product quality has a big, big effect on that. When we first tested them 15 years ago, the product was 
was terrible. And so the data that we generated in those days probably is, is pretty much worthless. Um, the product quality today is excellent at these things that are being sold. Uh, the application conditions, you have to put them out at the right time, to the right soil moisture and things like that. So that, those also make a difference. Can I have the next slide, please? So let me just show you, since, since we've been putting these products out, or since you've been putting these products out, just uh, a little bit of the data that we've seen. Um, initially, uh, a couple of guys down around the Wachula and, um, and um, Golden Green area uh, let us bury some of our caged um, diapeptes larvae in the groves that they were going to treat with this product. Then they went ahead and did the treatment and we looked to see what happened. And you can see that in, in a grove that was more or less equivalent to a ridge situation, uh, we found that, as we found a lot of times when we're testing these products, we don't really find any H bacteria in the cadavers as, as we're looking to see what killed these animals. We lost them, we killed about 60% of the nematodes. Well, 60% of the nematodes died over that period of time. Uh, about 35% have this S uh, diacrepizide in them. Um, then other ones have these free living nematodes that compete with S diacrepizide. That means that S diacrepizide killed them. So just these other guys took over the cadaver. And then there were other causes for some of these. That was in a very coarse sandy soil. In a more of a typical flatwood soil, uh, we didn't find as much S. diacrepizide as typical. We found a lot of H. indica that's typical, a native nematode going in there and killing these guys. And here we got a little bit of H. bacteria off right now that we're seeing uh, also killed some of these nematodes. And these guys, these free living nematodes again. So not quite as much control in the uh, flatwoods as in the ridge uh, in this particular case. Next slide, please. Uh, we've gone into a peach orchard in Vero Beach with these products in the last three months or so. And, well, now with these products, I'm sorry, with species that we're interested in. We were growing Henroarabditis bacteriophora in our laboratory and Steinerberfield uh, Grave, the one I'd like to see back on the market. And we're, we're treating in this peach orchard because it's got myoceris in there. The, the Sri Lankan weevil, that's kind of new in the state, I don't think you guys have it over here yet. Um, and we just want to see what the effect is on, on, that, on that evil. But again, we buried our caged diapreppies in there before we put these treatments out. And so here's what we see in the controls. We've got heterorabditis indica down there, and uh, just natives, it's about 20% of them dead. Here we got heterorabditis bacteria off where we treated and we're, we're picking it up here. Plus, a lot of these free living nematodes were probably killed by HP and HI. And then where we put the cyanide in Rio Grave, uh, you can see what we're getting back out. Uh, of that. And this was the actual mortality. This is just the intimal pathogenic nematodes that we got back out. So we, we had a mortality of well over, uh, well, it looks like 90%. Where we put out the Steiner Nemer Rio Brave, and I don't know, about 80 something, where we put out the heterorabditis bacteria flora compared to about 40 something for the untreated control. So that's the situation that we've seen so far using these products that are available to you today. Next slide. We'll be putting out another treatment next week, as a matter of fact. Um, so, can we improve the performance of these products? There's one thing that we've been funded to do this year that might be a little trick that might, um, might be helpful. Next slide. Um, Diaprepes abreviatus, the citrus root weevil, evolved in the Caribbean. So, it's a more, you know, it's a tropical species of insect. And up here in Florida, it's right at the northern edge of its range. It can't go any further north because it can't deal with the cold temperatures, essentially. So these are like soil temperatures over the course of the year in a couple of locations in Puerto Rico compared to like what happens in Florida. Next slide, please. And Steve McCoy and some of the guys at US DA a few years ago published data showing essentially that the eggs of diaphragmas are the real susceptible stage, and that's the reason that it can't really move further north. But the other larvae are also affected by these low temperatures, these low wintertime temperatures that we get here to a certain extent. And so it is stressful for these weevils. Whether or not it's killing them, it appears to be stressful. So what we've done is to do some experiments in the lab where we've pre-stressed the weevil by chilling it down for maybe three days, like might occur over a period of time in the winter time here. If I can have the next slide. Um, well, let me just show you. These are kind of typical winter periods when we get freezing weather here. And so you can have this really cold weather in the 10 or 12 degree centigrade range. Uh, for a couple of days, and then it'll warm right back up again to 18 degrees. You know what it's like up there, all of a sudden you get a nice warm day after it freezes. And at the 18 degrees, these nematodes are capable of infecting. 
at the lower temperatures, most of them know that they're not capable of infecting, but maybe that is stressing the region. So we've tried to reproduce this in the laboratory to get an idea if it's a feasible concept. And the next slide shows you some of the data. Um, this is a situation where we've taken the larvae and for a few days, we've chilled them down, and then we uh, either warm them back up or we leave them in cooler temperatures and subject them to the nematodes to see whether the nematodes kill them. And you can see here, for example, with this real bravi, when we chilled it down at a low temperature, and then we offered it to the nematode at a higher temperature, we got a complete mortality, as opposed to if the uh, nematode was never chilled down, and then exposed to the nematode, to the, uh, nematode if the, excuse me, the insect was never chilled down, and then exposed to the nematode, much lower mortality. We're only putting a few of these nematodes in there, but it's, it's a very low rate. So they're killing at a very low rate, but even that low rate is doing an excellent job if we stress the insect first. And we're seeing similar things here with um, heteroratophytes bacteria offer, where we're really increasing the efficacy of that nematode by chilling down the insect first. And so the idea here is that perhaps we could be treating, not only in the summertime, we've never recommended that nematodes be used for treatment, when the soil temperature drops below 20 degrees, they're just not very effective. But it's conceivable here where the um, where these insects are stressed during a freeze event, and you put out, you know, as you're doing your cold protection, you put out these nematodes, and in a couple of days they're going to kill very effectively. So that's a possibility that we'll be testing hopefully this winter if we get some cold enough weather and uh, see whether or not we might extend the treatment period um, uh, year round and, and perhaps even get better control of the insect. Next slide, please. Okay, general recommendation. Just a few more, uh, few more points. Next slide. Um, rather than go through in any detailed way, I just want to make everybody aware that the same way that the relationship between the nematodes and, and the same way that, that diaprepes is more of a problem in some parts of the state than the other, means that it, it really has regional recommendations. There are different scenarios uh, of, of, of situations in Florida that we should be aware of and, and probably tailor your management based on, on those situations. So for managing diaprepes, really the best thing to do is go to the CRE website, you go to the extension section and go to the weevil section. And when you get to the weevil section, and when you get to the weevil section, then just click on the diaprepes uh, task force website. And there's lots of information there. Um, all of the papers that have ever been published are there as PDFs and um, stuff like that. But the most important thing as far as management goes is there is a management key in there. So you would click on management key. And uh, if I could have the next slide. What it's going to do in terms of those scenarios is it's going to tell you whether you need to focus on various of these things and, and what the recommendations might be. So rootstock selection is going to be critically important. And the reason for that is that if you've got Phytophthora and Koshiani in your groves, like you might have on a central ridge or in a lot of the flatlands groves, you really want to have some trifoliate type rootstock like Swingle that's resistant to Phytophthora, to Phytophthora and Koshiani. Um, there are some Spanish ones that we're testing now that are working really well in Spain against um, citrus nematode uh, that, that hopefully will work well here too. It will expand the options because they perform very well in high pH soil, uh, not just in low pH soil, lower pH soil like the soil. But if you have Phytophthora palmivora, for some reason that resistance breaks down when diaprepes. It's resistant to palmivora normally. The trifoliate resistance breaks down in diaprepes is there. And the rootstocks that seem to perform the best are ones with pumelo in them and mandarin in them, things like Clio or these, some of these USDA releases in the last 10 years or so, 802, 897. Some of those seem to perform better where you've got Phytophthora or palmivora. So if you're planting a grove, you want to know that information as you're going in. I think you understand now that soil drainage is a critical thing. It's not just for the nematodes. So also diaprepes probably just likes wetter soil. I don't know much about that. We haven't studied that, but it probably does. And certainly, if you have root problems and the soil is wetter rather than well-drained, the tree is much more stressed as well. So soil drainage is critical when you're thinking about diaprepes. And then as far as spraying goes, well, you know what? You, 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 you treat every few weeks now, and you would think that the diaprepes problem would be gone, but it's not. Um, the treatments are not affecting the adults so well, but probably, 
where he used the right root stocks, that was also very important because of the Phytophthora and Koshiani that was out there. So Swingle was yielding much better than the Cleo, which wouldn't be recommended in that situation. C35 was also a very good root stock in that situation, similar to Swingle. So those are the kind of take-home messages. You, you double the yield with, with proper management of the adults, in, in this case, and he further doubled the yield again by the proper use of root stocks in this case. And that's really the backbone of management right now. That's what you've got. Unfortunately, diaprepes, as I heard Phil Stanley say many, many years ago in Florida, every year we get a new pest, and every year it comes under biocontrol and we learn how to manage it. Diaprepes is the only one that, you know, it just, Keeps being a problem decade after decade. Next slide. Okay, just a couple of more um, things about management that I, I think <coughs> are probably important. This, we have done a number of studies where we put landscape fabric on the soil to see what it does to the organisms and to see what the tree responses are. This was from our first study. And essentially, uh, trees always grow better. If you, if you were to put, you know, what we did was we just trenched along the side and buried the edge of this landscape and we pulled it over and slid it because the trees were already planted and uh, pinned it in place. And that landscape fabric lasted in good shape for about six years, which more than covered the herbicide savings costs as far as the cost of the application of that material. So it paid for itself in that sense. The trees grew much better. Under that, this wasn't the best test for diaprepes control because there's so few diaprepes on the central ridge. I think we tracked for two years and caught six or seven regions. But we did the same thing over in this row that I just showed you that Clay did his stuff in. And we found almost, I think we found one weevil coming up where our traps were placed here, coming up under, out from here, as opposed to where we don't have any of that tarp or the traps here. We, we caught hundreds and hundreds of weevils coming up out of the soil. So this is too tight for a neonate to go through and penetrate. It blocks about 99% of the neonates from getting into the soil. And if they do get into the soil, they can't get back out of here. So um, it is very effective, probably, as a management tool. And I think it's something that if I really had a bad diagrammatic problem, the fact that you save all of those herbicide costs, I'd do it. I'd give it a try. Next slide. And then this is the last thing I'll show you. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've worked with um, Jim Grosser and Module Dutch's program to look at some um, genes that have been trans that, that have been put into citrus uh, rootstocks that um, should theoretically have some effect on insects. And this is just to show you. These are six seedlings that we uh, that have been exposed to about for about three months to diaprepes larvae, uh, either on Cleopatra mandarin with no transformation or Cleopatra mandarin, which uh, this gene called a snowdrop lectin gene was inserted into the, into the plant. And you can see that um, we have a number of genes and a number of lines 